Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do these free mentoring roundtables week after week after week. This is the 471st session. We started doing these way back when in the fall of 2008, at that time, it was just an experiment, but it blossomed into the full-blown 1 million by 1 million program a couple of years later. This event is being recorded. All recordings of every single roundtable are available on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtable. If you're live tweeting today, please use hashtag 1M1M and join us on Twitter at 1M by 1M and at Romana. These are the call-in instructions. We have some scheduled programming first, and then I will open the line up for call-in and uh, you know, audience Q&A. I do want you to participate as much as you wish to, because this is a roundtable, not a broadcast. We want to hear from all of you and, and uh, dialogue with all of you. In the meantime, uh, while the phone line is not yet open, please use the public chat. Make sure you set the public chat to send to all participants and not to private messages to me. Because I will be anchoring the show, it will be very difficult for me to dialogue with you in private chat while I'm doing that. But, um, but we will you know, be able to pick up questions from public chat and so on and so forth as we go along. Today, we will start the show with a conversation with Exa Zhang, founder and CEO of You First Capital. Exa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Maureen, and uh, thank you, Shamana, for all your efforts here. Really appreciate it and looking forward to it. All right. Well, introduce us to uh, your work at You First Capital. Tell us about what you're doing. Sure. Um, so, I'm the CEO and founder of You First Capital, uh, which is a venture capital arm uh, dedicated to corporations. Um, so, you know, in some sense, we are flipping the venture capital model by starting uh, from the end of the funnel. So, startups would, you know, VC funds would invest in startups and grow them with the hope of um, you know, the startups getting acquired by corporations. We are flipping the model in some sense where we are starting with the requirements of the corporation um, with the goal of becoming their support or extended venture arm and investing on their behalf into sectors uh, of their interest only. And mm -hmm. along with that, we're raising our own venture fund um, so we can invest alongside those corporations um, when and as and when we kind of build those funds with the corporates. Okay. So how big is your fund? So each fund size varies based on the corporate we are talking about or referring to. Uh, for our own individual funds, it's a small $20 million fund we are raising for now to invest uh, alongside our corporate plans. Do you have any current fund or are you only raising funds right now? So we are uh, in the process of uh, uh, closing our fund. So there are some commitments from some LPs, uh, but at the same time, you know, that's for the personal, you know, you know you basically you first capital fund that invests alongside corporates, but we have a fund announced with Dow DuPont as an example. Uh, and it was covered by Venture Beat and Forbes um, as a, they found the model intriguing and interesting. And um, that uh, that. So do you have any ongoing. corporation that has a fund with you currently? Yeah. So Dow DuPont is one of the examples where they have gone public with regard to the announcement. There are other corporations as well that are working with us, but uh, at the moment uh, they they choose not to go public as just as yet. So uh, in that case, we should restrict our discussion to the one that you can discuss, that value point. How big is that fund? So uh, you know, the fund size is less than 20 million. 
And like I said, we are raising our own fund, which is again around less than 200 million. No, I don't want to hear about what funds you're raising. I'm only interested in funds that are already raised and in deployment because, you know, right now you are talking to us, an audience base that is interested in talking to investors who already have funds. So uh, we right. do get a lot of pieces from people who are raising funds and so on and so forth. That's not what we cover. We only cover funds that are already raised and complete. So let's focus yeah. our discussion on funds that you have already raised. What is the size of the Value First fund? So this is a less than $20 million fund. I can't tell the what exact What does that mean? Less than $20 million could be $1 million. Less than $20 million can be $5 million. What is the size of the fund? Sorry, Samana, we cannot disclose the size of the fund here. We sent you a set of talking points. You accepted those talking points and came on the show, and, and now you're saying that you don't want to discuss those talking points. What's, what's the point of this interview? Well, actually, this is, uh, like I said, it's, uh, we can tell you the exact number, but, I mean, I can tell you it's a 20, less than $20 million fund. Anybody can Google up uh, and see Dow DuPont and U First Capital and their public announcements with regard to that fund. Have you invested from that fund? Yeah, we're in the course of doing that. Okay, uh, Eksa, I will honestly say that I think this interview is premature. Why don't you get a little bit further along and we'll reschedule this interview because I, I don't think this is going to be a productive interview. If, if everything is in the works and nothing can be discussed, I don't think it's, it makes for a good interview. It's not in your interest no to problem. have this interview. No problem. That's fine. Okay, thank you. No. Sorry thank about you. that. Mm -hmm. We will flip to the entrepreneur pitch section. Um, I just want to set expectations here. We do this as a safe working session. You don't need to be nervous. You don't need to be defensive. Just focus on discussing what is it that you're struggling with, what is it that you are trying to get input on, and we'll focus on that in this forum. Um, if you disagree with my feedback, that's fine too. It's your venture. You will make the final decision on how to navigate and how to, you know, put one foot before the other. So my job is to give you feedback, and that's what I will do. You can take it or leave it. All right, Sean, Dana, oh, you idea. are. Go ahead. Hi, Stromano. This is Ian. I just wanted to say that I do love this idea. I think that, uh, uh, you know, a great feedback, be it uh, positive or, uh, you know, a room for improvement is a, a huge value to an entrepreneur. And uh, we, due to yeah, our... You uh, are going to come next. We're going to talk to Sean first. So just hang on for a good. moment. Your turn to come. Meanwhile, don't interrupt the presentation. It's Sean's turn now. Are you able to hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk with you all. Uh, just to give you a background, I found uh, one in by one in through your blog post, um, in particular about uh, fab.com and, and guilt.com, and I found them to be germane to sort of the venture that uh, the opportunity that I'm here to present. So the company or the uh, concept is called Atelier, which is a play on the word atelier, um, meaning workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, and our goal is to give members exclusive and easy access to the world's best luxury designs and brands at a differentiated price point. And I'm going to kind of walk you through what that means and, and how um, that all comes together in the next few slides. If you could hit the next slide for me. Thank you so much. So uh, just give you a who uh, I am or where we are today in, in the stage of the business and also um, some of our goals for today, what we would, uh, what I would really like to get out of um, the session. So my name is Sean Dehan. Uh, my, my background is in manager consulting corporate strategy uh, in investment finance. I am a two-time entrepreneur, uh, one-time um, founder, and one-time acquirer um, of small businesses. I started my first business while I was in college, and it was actually in the textile and um, uh, clothing design business. Um, I am based out of Austin, Texas, and graduated from the University of Texas as well. Uh, the currently, Atelier is in, in the concept validation phase, um, and uh, uh, our current focus is exposing this idea that as many um, and thinkers, investors, and luxury good players as possible to receive, receive feedback and validation on the concept. Um, and our main goals today are to practice um, concept, business pitch, 
receive business feedback from you, Samana, and anyone else on the line. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if there's any opportunity to network or anyone on the line has any connections to luxury good industry leaders, um, always uh, great to expose um, the concept to more folks and more eyes. Um, so the purpose of Atelier is uh, to open the world uh, to great design and great quality of uh, to the next generation of luxury buyers. Um, so we do that in two ways. Uh, we have two constituents. It's a marketplace model. On the, on the one hand side, we have our clients or our members. Um, and the goal is uh, we do that by making buying off-price luxury products a unique and great experience for them. Uh, and then on the other side, we have our brand partners um, who, through whom, for whom we sell off-price luxury goods um, uh, to a valuable brand building channel. So uh, whereas typically the off-price luxury uh, is seen as um, a brand uh, dilutive or brand equity negative um, exercise or channel, um, our goal is to expose our brand partners to highly qualified current and future full-price customers through our membership model. Uh, next page, please. Just to, um, a quick definition of terms, uh, just to set the stage and kind of talk about what we really mean by luxury, off-price, and post-retail and value retail. So luxury... Um, it's sort of uh, the classic, you know it when you see it, uh, the Louis Vuitton, the Gucci, the Balenciaga, the Hermes of the world. Um, these aren't the high-end um, main street or high street um, companies like Michael Kors and Coach um, and uh, Marc Jacobs, but rather the sort of upper echelon of luxury. Um, and I'll kind of go into why that distinction matters here, um, in particular for our membership model. Uh, off price, by off price, you mean anything, any good effectively sold below full retail price, but targeting between 30% to 70% um, and below uh, the retail price. Um, post retail is kind of a term that, that I've made up um, or created uh, for the purpose of, of this concept. Um, the outlet concept or outlet term is a little bit of a dirty word in the luxury and the true luxury brand space. Um, and, uh, and so post-retail is really designed to incorporate the concept of um, leveraging a, a third channel, a wholesale, retail, and then post-retail channel to engage customers, um, high value and high quality customers uh, at a differentiated price point. So that could include anything between um, uh, uh, stuff that's happening in e-commerce flagships that are at a discount outlet store, third-party third commerce off price, and secondhand goods like the Real Real or Vestiaire Collective. Next page, please. So th this page, um, Sermana, to be totally honest with you, is really meant to just be uh, a, this is a sizable market page. Uh, it isn't meant to um, express the intent of we're attacking a massive uh, multi-billion dollar market because I do fundamentally believe that this is a niche business concept. I think it can be a sizable and strong and healthy business, um, but I don't believe that it can be uh, a five to ten billion dollar market cap business, um, along the lines is kind of the vision that Gilt had for we its love business. niche business with Sean, so uh, absolutely go for it. If it's a solid niche business that you can penetrate with a, you know, reasonable strategy, uh, that's perfectly fine. For sure, yeah. So um, I actually really like the concept of this niche and that it doesn't require. Uh, uh, a massive um, total adjustable market to, to go after. Um, the confluence of trends make off-price currently um, more relevant than perhaps ever really has been for luxury brands, and you're seeing more luxury brands um, express intent in the uh, off-price or post-retail space. Um, some of the trends, sustainability being one of them, sustainability of supply chain um, uh, being important, off-price and post-retail help with that because it gives um, the already existing energy and uh, natural resources that have gone into a product, um, a continued life and a home uh, for that product at potentially a different price point. Generational transfer, what that simply means is that as uh, baby boomers um, transition uh, into um, a smaller portion of uh, core luxury customers, Gen Y and Gen Z will start to take a, a larger portion of that. And as that begins to happen, Gen Y and Gen Z will um, continue to sort of introduce themselves to luxury through um, post-retail channels, whether it's uh, secondhand at lower prices or, or off-price at lower prices, as they continue to grow up and um, get that sort of uh, core customer buying at full price and flagship, flagship store um, uh, status. Then we have e-commerce as well. Uh, uh, E-commerce is obviously changing the game broadly for luxury brands, and luxury brands continue to be slow in the, in the game of getting into e-commerce, but... Um, that is changing. And then value of customer data um, is, uh, has grown in, in importance to luxury brands, in particular owning customer data 
um, so that they can continue to engage uh, with folks um, in non-transactional ways as well as through the life cycle of um, their engagement with uh, the brand. And so uh, luxury brands are oftentimes now thinking about um, customers in it from a lifetime value perspective, which is a traditional sort of SaaS metric um, and not a traditional retail metric but they are thinking about it from a lifetime value perspective. And so the post-retail or the off-price channel can really engage customers and improve lifetime value for luxury brands. Next slide, please. Um, so I don't want to go too deep into this, but this basically just gives you the idea of what the current channels are um, and whether and how and whether they um, meet the needs of both the two constituents, the luxury brands on the left-hand side. Yeah, and, and your business. Let me try to make this a productive discussion. What is sure. the membership sure. model? Who's becoming a member of this? Yeah, so great, great question. So on the left-hand side in this slide, this is kind of a helpful uh, just operating model um, uh, image. So on the left-hand side, you have the, the members who pay an annual, annual fee for the exclusive and unique access to previous collection goods. Um, and our target here are kind of the new term, what's called Henry's uh, high earners, uh, not rich yet. Um, kind of sub-segment, uh, particularly female, uh, at least initially, um, as well as uh, folks that have a, um, a, a desire for high-quality design but aren't necessarily always fashion-forward. So with the fashion-forward crew tends to go toward fast fashion and changing with the seasons, um, and whereas the design, um, the design focused and the uh, quality focused and brand focused um, uh, consumers um, will stay with uh, luxury brands um, on previous collections uh, and not just focus on the latest drop um, that may that they may have. So on that left hand side, and you what have is that, the um, membership and, fee and that you're assuming? Yeah, so uh, Sermana, that's that's kind of a thing that we're continuing to uh, validate from from a concept perspective. It is a challenge to validate it right now because we don't have um, a definitive roster of brands that uh, that will engage with us and 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 be on the sort of right hand side of the marketplace. And until we have that, I don't know that we can guarantee I can give you a really um, tight model. But I have had concept validation conversations with the target customers, um, a handful, maybe about 10 or so. And generally speaking, it's a pretty broad range. But uh, I asked them to throw out a number of what they might be willing to pay. And, and folks say anywhere between 250 to $500 um, a, a year, that is, um, to access uh, these, these brands at Offspring. I don't think you will be able to get people to pay 200 to $500 until you have a you know very wide selection of really good products on the platform, people are not going to pay you two hundred to five hundred dollars waiting for you to go. I totally agree. Get the brand. Yeah, that is the so, chicken and egg uh, problem. I think for sure. My my feedback to you is that try to get the brands and the merchandise on which you can start transacting. Don't try to charge a membership fee anytime soon until you have enough activity going on on the site and your primary model then is the sales commission or whatever way you decide to monetize on a transaction fee basis. I don't think the membership fee basis is gonna work anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, do you, from a strategic, pers or from a sort of customer strategy perspective, I, I, I totally understand that and, and hear that feedback. Um, do you think there's, I think the, the value of the membership for this model um, is not just from a uh, revenue perspective for Batelier, but also from uh, a qualification perspective for brands, right? So um, the concept is that uh, brands They won't be able to get blocked. anybody to pay the membership. My point is different. You know, you have, you can only do what is doable. You know, right. everything else is fantasy. So, so I'm, you're going to need to. I'm with to... you. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. That the first, the first order of business is to, um, is to sort of build up brands uh, and yeah. build a roster of brands with merchandise on the site. Um, I wonder if there's a there's a, a way uh, in which that happens, uh, and you build sort of a wait list um, for the the membership side of things, and then once um, the sort of roster and merchandise is exposed uh, to begin transacting. There's a way to sort of um, move folks into the membership model because I do sense that going from a open marketplace uh, model to then hitting folks with a membership um, will be a, will be challenging. The way I would do it, 
the way I would do it is I would start acquiring customers and I, start, I would start acquiring merchandise and let transactions happen. Once your members start transacting, let's say people buy one or two pieces and then you can start, you can go back to them and say, now we're going to switch you to a membership model. Now that you've got a feel for the kind of merchandise we are bringing you, we would, we would like to switch you to a membership model. So if you'd like to continue, then we, this is the membership and this is how it's going to work. But I think my guess is for a while, you can have some sort of a, a process where people, you know, potential members get to transact, get to buy five products or ten products before joining, before signing up for the membership. But you're going to have to let them try and then become a member. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Yeah, that's 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 really that's really good feedback. I think the the key I, one one thing that we haven't gone over is just that I think the the key to this concept and it needs to be validated with the brands. But from the research that I've done on other players in this space, the key to the concept for brands is that it, they are fine in uh, operating in, in in the value retail the post retail space, but what they're looking for is for a platform that can bring them high quality, um, highly yeah, you uh, tell them the sort same of thing. qualified, you qualified tell them um, folks. Thing that we're going to need to be able to show our potential members that high quality products are coming onto this platform to lure them into becoming a member. But in long term, you promise them that yes, we're going to create this membership uh, community. And at some point, when you have enough of enough traction, you have enough of a you know, enough of a membership, you get a bit of press and, and so on and so forth, then you can start going to membership directly. You know, maybe you start with people can buy 10 things before they become members. Then you reduce that to people can buy five things before they become members. You can reduce that to, over time, you can reduce that to people buy one thing before they become a member. And then eventually, they don't have to buy anything, become a member because your membership is already a proven commodity. Yeah, so, that's, that's interesting. That's it's, interesting. It's, it's a matter it's similar, of, it's similar to Beauty Pie. If you're familiar with Beauty Pie. All right, Sean, I'm going Thank to you. switch. You're welcome. Um, Ian, you're next. All right. Hello, Sumana. Hello. Yes. How can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Perfect. That's good. Uh, right, so my name is Ian, and uh, I represent uh, a company called Milestone Based, uh, where we believe that, uh, um, um, so basically it's a three-sided platform between uh, GPs, and LPs, and portfolio companies, and we believe that we are able to improve the venture capital industry overall. Um, let's go to second slide. Mm, so... To my previous experience, we've been working on in the blockchain space before, and that's how we got to fintech, and we got to realize that there is so much that um, technology, <clears throat> artificial intelligence, and uh, you know, new tech overall can do to financial industries overall, and private equity, uh, uh, VC in particular, has become our focus. Um, getting to slide number three, so we are. Um, aimed to revolutionize early stage funding. The way we plan to do it is basically to um, um, help entrepreneurs get more exposure to venture capital as they uh, have incremental um, successes in their execution. So the, the better you are doing as an early entrepreneur in terms of your traction based on data, the more eyeballs you will get from the VC firms who are subscribed to receive the signals from the company like yourself, based on the stage of the company, the industry, uh, the business model, etc. cetera. Um, next slide. The problem statement is that venture funding is actually inefficient. Um, it's a lot of spray and pray in the early stage, and that's basically how it works. The issue with this, though, is that it's not um, sufficiently quantified and parameterized. And so we want to bring in more of the data in the space um, so that um, uh, more capital would be available based on all the parameters and structures that we are creating. Um, slide number five, our solution. Um, 
is the portfolio management platform that has two aspects of it. The first aspect is the collaboration between the venture capital firms and uh, their LPs. And we are helping VC firms to build better uh, uh, communication with LPs through more transparent insight into what's happening uh, and the portfolio companies. As we know, LPs are having more and more appetite towards um, co-investment and direct investment because they are they are able to uh, decrease the overall management cost of the capital. Um, so we we are trying to catch that uh, wave. And next slide um, shows um, that we basically are also covering the relationship between uh, GPs and portfolio companies. Um, the portfolio companies are able to create their roadmaps, uh, set their KPIs, and enable their VC firms, the two are current investors or future investors, to track the progress, uh, report the progress back to LPs, and have VC firms, meaning GPs who sit on the board as well as advisors, more involved into operational process of the company. Uh, next slide. Um, so we basically spent the entire 2019 validating the uh, key hypotheses, statements, and uh, uh, what have you, and have built the advisory board uh, out of people such as Tim Friedman, who previously has been the uh, he has been the early uh, sorry the early um, employee at uh, Prequen. He basically. Um, took Prequen, uh, which is one of the largest private equity databases in the world, from the UK to the United States, helped uh, grow it here, um, left it two years ago, uh, and started advising us last year. Artem is from the venture capital space. Uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> Miko Matsumura is, uh, is a VC um, manager. And he is helping us with the strategy. Uh, Stu Tweedy represents uh, the family uh, office space. He works at Mercina Capital, which is the multifamily office um, here. Give in... me a lot of uh, validation, quote unquote, from advisors. I'm actually, as a principal in One Million by One Million, we don't believe in validation from advisors. We want to see validation from customers. So you have a marketplace that you're trying to build, which is catering to VCs on the one side and, and uh, startups on the other side. So what validation have you done with actual VCs who want to become your customers and actual startups who want to provide this kind of data on this platform? Um, sure, good question. Um, and I, I don't have the slide for that, so let's just um, discuss it. Um, we are in touch with um, up to 100 VC firms um, in terms of two types of services that we provide for them. First is the portfolio monitoring, and second is the LP sourcing, uh, meaning matchmaking between bench capital firms and LPs. Uh, speaking of the, so we know for sure that the, the companies um, in the bench capital space are interested in the solution that would uh, make the board meetings more uh, efficient, that would make entrepreneurs more organized uh, to help entrepreneurs get prepared for due diligence, for investing, for um, sitting on the board and reporting their progress, uh, engaging the right uh, advisors who can help. Now, on the entrepreneur side, they apparently will go everywhere where the capital is more accessible. And uh, um, I had, like a friend of mine has built a similar company before, and it's had a success uh, where entrepreneurs were uh, happily sharing their traction data, so they were connecting the data sources such as CRM to marketing analytics and what have you, uh, and share that data with uh, GPS. So what question do you have for me? Um, Probably we, we would like to talk about the the the, the toughest uh, things in our business, which actually is getting a hold of family offices. Uh, while we do have a lot of interest from venture capital firms, it's easy to talk to them. Um, family offices space and LP overall seems to be a very relationship based. Yeah, they don't do emails. It's very hard to get them engaged uh, 
on any kind of platform. So if you could give a suggestion there, that would be of great value, really. So you were saying that you want to you want to facilitate relationships between family offices and VC firms and help facilitate the fundraising process of venture capitalists. Correct. Yeah. I don't buy that this is going to happen because, as you said, it is a highly relationship-driven business. This is not something that happens in the way that you're talking about. This is a very old-fashioned industry, and it's uh, very unlikely that you're going to be able to crack into this in this mode. I see. Um, yeah, it, it, it's indeed a problem to solve. Another um, idea we had was to somehow engage placement agents who already have those relations with LPs. What do you think about that? Could that be, you know, the area of... It uh, doesn't matter. As I said, it doesn't matter what I think about it. Anything, any hypothesis that you're working with, you're going to have to go check with those people. Like, go talk right. to 100 placement agents and see if they have need, if they're interested in doing something with you, and if so, what is the pain point that they are trying to solve? So if you want to do a product that engages placement agents, you need to under, you need to talk to them, immerse yourself in that community, and understand what is their primary pain point that you could solve, which would give them reason to engage with you. All right. Okay. The same. Basically, our process regarding product design is exactly the same in every single case, which is, it's very simple. Immerse yourself in the segment, in the customer segment, in the precise customer segment that you want to build a product in, nothing else. And, and that is going to answer your question. You know, I can give you some random, you know, feedback based on my gut and so forth, but ultimately, you know, that doesn't really matter. What really matters is what do customers want. That's fair. Thanks okay. for the suggestion. Yeah. You're welcome. All right, folks, if you like what we're doing here, refer 1 million by 1 million to serious entrepreneurs who are willing to put in the many years that it takes to build a company. Resources-wise, you'll find everything at 1mby1m.com. Our blog is very rich. You'll learn a lot from the blog, and it's free. The Entrepreneur Journey's book series, there are 12 volumes, you can learn from those. The free roundtables happen every week, week after week after week, so you're welcome to attend any of these roundtables. We have a full acceleration program that is 1M by 1M Premium for extensive methodology guidance. That's our full acceleration program. You can use the 1M by 1M self-assessment and these are questions that investors would ask you. You need to be able to answer these questions. If you get stuck, use 1M by 1M Basic, which is our curriculum only uh, subscription model, and you can learn how to answer these questions. The premium program is described abundantly on the website, so is the basic. So go dig around on the website and Look at the FAQs, video FAQs, curriculum description, etc. We are a case study based program. So we teach everything on the basis of case studies. We kind of model things, understand it, understand different strategies based on other people's experiences, people who have been successful with those strategies, and then bring them to you as methodology elements. Our core methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. Bootstrap first, raise money later is the mantra. We have three more roundtables, free roundtables in February, pretty much every Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time. We have online rendezvous every Tuesday mornings. That also we have three more left, also 8 a.m. Pacific time. And on that, I'm live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And then we have one more in-person rendezvous. We had one last night, and we have one more this month. That's February 19th, 5 p.m. Pacific time at Cafe Boroni. Now, this is something that anybody who is in Silicon Valley can attend, or if you're visiting Silicon Valley, you can attend as well. So that's it. The line is open for Q&A. Anyone in the room who would like to chat, 
you can call in or you can start asking questions in public chat as well, and I'll pick up questions from public chat and answer them. In the meantime, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. Irina will answer any questions you might have about the 1M by 1M program. Um, that's pretty much it in terms of scheduled programming for uh, this particular session. It was a shorter roundtable than usual, partly because we had a bit of a false draft with our guests. Curtis Boyd is asking, I run a bootstrap company, we're profitable. What revenue marker is best to start thinking about raising money? Curtis, it's not revenue marker. I need to understand the quality of revenue, the dynamics of revenue, there's all kinds of things. So you're gonna to need to come and pitch. Uh, I suggest you go to the free public roundtable page on our website, sign up to come and pitch. I'll look at your business and give you very detailed feedback on exactly what your options are right now. It's not purely a function of revenue. You're very welcome. Anybody else? By the way, my LinkedIn course on bootstrapping is very popular and very highly regarded. So if you're looking to Look at the you know, basics of bootstrapping. That's a very, very convenient one-hour course where you can get all the fundamentals. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Yes, no? Nobody else. There's so many people in the room. Nobody else has a question. Very quiet group. Ah, here's one. Are you able to hear me? No. Who is this? This is Brian Sturmer. Are you able to hear me? No, I can, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, since no one else is on, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Brian Sturmer. I'm a retiring U.S. Army officer, um, and I have a patented idea that I'm looking to market to wireless communication providers and cell phone manufacturers. and. Um, hey, um, looking for ideas, took a bunch of notes, and uh, um, someday hope to present and discuss the idea a little bit further with you. Sounds great. Absolutely. By all means, please go to the free public roundtables and sign up for a pitch, and uh, look forward to looking, look forward to discussing your uh, business more concretely. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Julia Harrison is asking, can you please explain what an entrepreneur can expect to gain from presenting at a round table? You get feedback on, on your project, next steps, what you need to do to address your issues. Like earlier today, you heard me talk about validation. There are entrepreneurs who are trying to validate and they're looking for one of the course corrections I made in the last, previous presentation is by saying that don't look for validation uh, signals from your advisors. Go look for validation and signals from your target customer base. It's a fundamental change in how you think about validation. So depending on what you present, I will give you those pointers. In the, in the first presentation today, you saw that I was giving pointers to business model issues like you know, membership fee, when to introduce your membership fee, how to introduce a membership fee. So whatever business strategy questions you might need input on or advice on, that's what you can expect to get by presenting at a roundtable. Does that answer your question? All right, anybody else? Questions, comments, dial-ins? Basically, this is a safe working session where you can bring your project for a candid discussion, and I will try my best to give you input on how to put one foot before the other and remove your load roadblocks. All right, folks, I don't see any more questions, so we will adjourn the session and see you back. Oh, no, here's some, somebody else is asking a question. 
Uh, Ramalingam Subramani, do you help starting companies in India also? One of our biggest geographies in, is India. One Million by One Million is the first and only global virtual accelerator. So we work in every part of the world. If you want to start a company in Timbuktu, we are happy to work with you on that company. India is one of our largest geographies. Anybody else before we adjourn? Uh, hi, this is Narendra. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, uh, my name is Narendra Gahir. Um, I am in the early stages of a product uh, which uh, which uh, basically is in the food catering industry. Okay. Uh, and the product uh, has been validated in the sense that we have uh, two uh, customers, paying customers. It's a subscription model. Uh, Fabulous. And uh, one of the challenges uh, that I am currently uh, going to is that um, this is not a full-time business as of now, uh, but there are all signs uh, that uh, with uh, uh, with enough focus, uh, this uh, this could be a good um, recurring revenue business uh, mm -hmm. within a year. Um, okay. so, so the challenge is how do you switch? When do you think it's the right time to switch uh, from uh, from being a being a part time uh, yeah. effort to a full time focused effort? And you know what do you so do? We use, to, mm -hmm. I know exactly what your question is. We we use bootstrapping with a paycheck very extensively in our program. We actually encourage entrepreneurs to bootstrap with a paycheck because you do have to pay the bills. And if you are you know bootstrapping, you're going to have to somehow stay afloat and, and uh, do a few things. And in your case, what sounds like a very nice situation is that you have managed to validate to some extent. So if you bring me your project, I'll be happy to give you more concrete feedback once I look at it in, in more detail. The other alternative is you can join the program and, and get uh, detailed guidance on every step of the way. We have used bootstrapping with its paycheck in a lot of, a lot of uh, entrepreneur scenarios in our membership and some of them have gone all the way up to break even some of them have gone to you know funding all kinds of things we have lots of great bootstrapping with the paycheck techniques sounds good um and how do i share my project product details with you is it via email or is there a different no you have to if you want the free round table that's the link is on on the website free public round table you can come and share there and if you want privacy, then you're going to have to join the premium program. Got it. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. Anybody else? Any other questions? All right. Well, last time I tried to adjourn, there were three more questions. So I am actually adjourning. If I don't see any more questions, I'm going to adjourn. Talk to you soon, folks. See you next week. Bye.